Today on Uncommon Knowledge, is it time to take Charles Darwin down a peg or two? Funding for this program is provided by the John M. Olin Foundation and the Star Foundation. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Our show today, Daring to Question Charles Darwin. 143 years after Darwin published On the Origin of Species, his theory of evolution is still controversial. Of course, the overwhelming majority of scientists continue to champion Darwin, but a few people, bright people, have begun to wonder just how well evolution has held up and to put forward a few controversial theories of their own. Joining us today, two guests. Eugenie Scott is director of the National Center for Science Education. William Dembski is a fellow at the Discovery Institute and the author of Mere Creation, Science, Faith, and Intelligent Design. The theory of evolution is now so thoroughly understood and so completely borne out by the physical evidence that anyone who questions evolution must be, in the words of scientist Richard Dawkins, either, quote, ignorant, stupid, wicked, or insane, close quote. Bill? Depending on what you mean by evolution, absolutely false. You're Jenny? not going to get a fight from me. That's a stupid thing to say. That's a stupid thing to say? <laughs> yes. Oh, really? You're both brushing Dawkins aside. But Dawkins is, well, is one of your boys, though, isn't he? Well, he's somebody who supports uh, uh, evolution and who thinks that evolution happened. I think evolution happened, too. But that statement's way over the top. I okay. think we both agree with that. All right. So Richard Dawkins puts your leash on. <laughs> Let's go through a couple of senses of evolution as a layman like me mm -hmm. understands it. Sense number one, evolution as change, merely as change. The planet has a long history. Certain living things that used to exist, such as dinosaurs, exist no longer. Certain li living things that now exist, such as human beings, appeared relatively recently in the history of the planet. Jeannie, you'd go for that. Works for me. And Bill. Works for me as well. Okay, so you then distinguish yourself from a fundamentalist or so-called young earth creationist who says the Bible claims the earth is about 6,000 years, that you don't I don't buy that. You have nothing to do with that. All right. Sense number two, mm -hmm. evolution in what I take to be a strict Darwinian sense. All living things, everything we see around us, from the uh, blade of grass to me, are descended from one or a few common ancestors by a process of random variation and natural selection. I would you augment, buy that one. I would augment that. There are two things going on. One, the idea the inference that we make from looking at lots of data that living things shared common ancestors. Secondly is what is the mechanism that brings that about? Those are distinct matters. Those are distinct matters. But I separate descent with modification or common ancestry, the and inference the of common and the mechanism. Of and one of the mechanisms is the one that you described. The random mechanism variation of and natural selection. The mechanism of natural selection. Right. Which involves genetic variation and adaptive value of the variance within a particular environment. But there's other mechanisms as well that may explain parts of the evolutionary process. Okay, so do you distinguish then between descent from common ancestors on the one hand, you refute that, you're open to it, you buy it, I'm, I'm open to, to common ancestry. I, I think that the, the evidence, I, I don't think I would go as far as Eugenia. I think there's still some, some question about that, but I know there, there are some very strong lines of evidence for common ancestry. And so you're open to that? So I'm open to that. That's not a problem for me. But that's how it turns out. the mechanism, random variation yeah. and natural selection, that I would say it's, it, it certainly operates, but it's incomplete. I mean, there's no question that organisms vary and that, uh, that those that are more fit, that are adapted in some way, will go on to survive and reproduce. Okay, so the, the mechanism, the Dar Darwin was on to something. question is, was he on to the whole show? Strict Darwinists like Richard Dawkins would want to say he really nailed it down. Uh, where I would differ, it, I, would, I would say the Darwinian mechanism probably only counts for about 2 to 3 percent of what we see. The Darwinian mechanism is a minor sideshow in the great geologic story 
of the planet and of living things. Is that, what, is that a summation of your uh, point of view? A minor sideshow might be minimizing it too much. Certainly, uh, antibiotic uh, resistance, I think, is something you could account for in terms of the uh, Darwinian mechanism, and that's, that's important. I mean, it's certainly Let me put it to you to this way. Yeah. Now, so we know, because we see with our own eyes, that within a yeah. species, mm -hmm. you can grow sheep with longer hair or yeah. shorter hair, or you can grow hogs that are fatter or get right. fatter more. So we know that you can, that through random variation or indeed intentional breeding, mm -hmm. you can create certain characteristics within a species. Right. That we grant, everybody grants that because we see it with our own eyes. Mm -hmm. But you can't, or we haven't seen with our own eyes, a sheep turned into a goat. That's, I mean, it's, it's the extrapolation. I mean, insects develop insecticide resistance. The Darwinian mechanism accounts for that, but how do you get insects in the first place? If the okay. Darwinian so story is correct, what you're saying is that what we, what we do see and what is irrefutable is relatively minor modulations within a species, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And the question is, can you extrapolate what we see going on in biology today to the past? An evolutionist would describe sheep and goats as being uh, descended from a common ancestor right. because sheep and goats actually are quite similar. Right. But because we do accept an ancient age of the earth, there's a lot of time for it to take place. Right. Okay. Um, On to some specific criticisms of Darwinism, beginning with the fossil record. I quote Jonathan Wells, a century and a half of fossil collecting since Darwin has made it clear that fossil species tend to appear suddenly and persist unchanged for long periods of time before going extinct. That is to say, it is very easy looking in the fossil record to find full-blown species, but they're suddenly there, and then they're suddenly not there, and you don't find in the fossil record lots of transitional forms, species on the way to becoming other species, which you would expect if, if the theory of evolution were true. Don't get your understanding of the fossil record from Jonathan Wells. Well, he, but, well how do you John, answer John, the John argument? Wells, how do you, he's citing Stephen Jay Gould and Oz Eldridge there. Yeah, but really, what are so Gould and Eldridge talking about? Well, Gould and Eldridge, Eldridge are not saying that living things didn't have common ancestors. Right. They're saying that the snapshot that we have of the history of life as revealed in the fossil record doesn't show um, uh, point by point ancestry such as Charles Darwin thought it would. The sort of gradualism now, which Dar Darwin said was really essential. If his, if his mechanism Why would gradualism account? be essential? And, and says what if, the if fossil it could, record... If it could be shown that any species evolved, could not have been gotten by gradual... Uh, I mean, it's a quote from yeah, The Origin of Species that's we, we repeated over know, and over you again, you know, that then, then my theory would absolutely, you know, bite the dust. Okay, okay so Stephen Jay Gould and Niall Eldridge, to name two of these guys, have characterized the fossil record is demonstrating something they called punctuated equilibria. There you have long periods of genetic stability punctuated by relatively short bursts of Rapid evolutionary evolution. creativity, right? Okay. And, and these you know short bursts, because they're show, so short, are very hard to find. It's in a the sampling fossil problem. It's, okay, a it's a sampling but problem. What, what the argu but the it's argument. It's a sampling problem. Well, right? but and, and that's, that's, I think, that, that's what raises eyebrows for the, some people. The argument about punctuated equilibria versus yeah, gradualism really within right. paleontology. Yes has to do with which explains more of the fossil record, because obviously both do. You find some sequences, particularly within vertebrates, where you have a very nice gradual record. Take a look at some of the molluscan series in, in East Africa. You have other, but we tend to think, you know, we tend to have these blinkers on. We only think about vertebrates. And vertebrates are very unlikely to show those kinds of... Uh, vertebrates are? Why is that? The reproductive cycles take a long time. Uh, an elephant takes a very long time, after all, to, to grow up and reproduce and so forth. And uh, they're, they're far rarer than our... Um, invertebrates like mollusks and, and other forms that leave a very copious fossil record. That's the major reason. What do you, what's your, what's your take uh, on the fossil record? That, it, that it's problematic or that... Well, I, I think it, what, what it seems, uh, you know, if, if, I, if I just look at it, you know, and I'm, right. I'm not trained as a paleontologist, but the, the sense I have is that you do have these long periods of stasis, things remain unchanged, and then these sudden emergences. Now, I think you can account for that in terms of common descent, but then you're, you're talking about some very rapid evolution, and there, it's not clear at all that you've got some sort of naturalistic mechanisms, either the Darwinian mechanism of random variation, natural selection. You can supplement that with some, some other uh, self-organizational processes, perhaps. Uh, but it, it's not clear that any sort of naturalistic mechanism that's been proposed has the capacity to account for that. And this is where I A new topic. We find very complex biological mechanisms everywhere in nature. Just how well does the theory of evolution account for them? We've got a biochemist called Michael Behe who's come up with a notion 
of irreducible complexity. And again, to me as a layman, reading this stuff, it seems quite sensible. So you're going to have to help me get over this one, so to speak. Behe draws a parallel with the mouse trap. It has a relatively few number of working parts, but every one of them is essential. This is what he called terms irreducibly complex. Take right. away one piece and it doesn't work. And there are all kinds of structures, lots and lots of structures in the physical world, the living world, that are likewise irreducibly complex. He mentions uh, biochemistry of light detection, requires a whole series of complex molecules and interacting in a very complicated way, take away a single molecule and the organism can't detect light. So the point is that it's very hard to imagine how some of these things could have evolved piecemeal. You have to imagine a mousetrap first evolving as a little piece of wood and then evolving the spring and then evolving that lever that actually, and that just seems intuitively, he well, says it's impossible and intuitively to me it seems a fairly forceful argument. Have you read any of the criticisms of irreducible complexity that have come out from scientists, from biochemists and uh, cell biologists who actually work in these I'm areas? I'm waiting for you to give okay. me, to characterize it. There that. is a long series of, of arguments against this and it's probably something that uh, is not going to be... I can one of these arguments for you just, just well. briefly. I mean, the, the idea is that you not only, let's say if you want to reduce uh, what, what you're calling an irreducibly complex mousetrap, not only do you remove a part, but you have to modify another part. And if you can modify, let's say, I mean, with the mousetrap, you remove what's, uh, it's got a hammer, a holding bar, a spring, platform, and a catch. You can remove the holding That's bar, the and then, uh, or rather, That's you can awesome. remove the catch and make a little indentation in the hammer, and then basically that indentation holds the holding bar and acts, acts like a catch. So okay. you, can re reduce, you can reduce it in that sense. It's the notion of irreducible complexity, I mean, Behe's, definition holds up. I mean, it's, it's that you remove a part and you can't get a functional mousetrap. But if you remove and modify, then you can get something functional. And so the idea is that you can get to these irreducibly complex systems, not just by adding parts, but adding, modifying, adding, modifying, adding, modifying. So that's supposed to be a way around that. And do now, you think that it is? Uh, is his I, I, argument a forceful argument I, against I think evolution it, I think or it's, not? I think it is. I think his notion needs a little fine-tuning. And I do that in my forthcoming book, No Free Lunch, where I argue you need not just okay. irreducible complexity, but you need a notion of minimal complexity so that, that basically you've got the simplest sort of uh, object that does that job. So you take, for instance, the, what's become the poster child of the design movement, the bacterial flagellum. It's a little outboard rotary motor on the back of the uh, bacteria. Okay. Uh, if you're going to have an outboard rotary motor, you're going to have to have, you're going to have to have something that's that's a propeller. You have to have something that attaches that thing to the cell membrane. You need a, you need a uh, motor that runs right. it. It's got to be bidirectional because this bacterium is buffeted by Brownian motion, so it's got to get through it. It's got to be able to reverse direction in order okay. to get around. So it needs all those all those components. When you actually look at the bacterial flagella that are out there, because it's not just in E. coli, but a number of different bacteria, you find that they're all substantially the same. I mean, they're, 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 a few sim they're few simplifications, right. but they, it, it's just so you, attaching you it to the cell membrane. This doesn't even no. cause a doubt for you? Not at all. Not at no, all. The, the concept of irreducible complexity has been pretty well um, thoroughly critiqued. Uh, the, the biggest problem is not whether there can or cannot be something that is irreducibly complex. That is not actually very interesting. The question is, can this be produced through a natural, natural. cause? Because that is the crux of the argument between uh, the intelligent design proponents and, and everybody okay. else. Intelligent. Eugenie just teed up the next topic, the theory of intelligent design. Intelligent design. It's a new and interesting school of thought, and you are its leading proponent. What does it say? Okay. It says that there are reliable means of detecting design from features of the world. So you look at arrangements of matter and energy. Some of those will tell you that you're dealing with a designing intelligence, others that you're not. So let's say you're watching the movie Contact. You see, what, what's the, this is a movie about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. There's a key moment in the movie where contact is established, where the radio astronomers realize that they're dealing with an extraterrestrial intelligence. This is when they get a long sequence of prime numbers from outer space. It's a long sequence. You couldn't just have, you know, a short sequence because that could just happen by chance because these radio astronomers are monitoring millions of radio channels. Okay, so it's got to be a long sequence. There's complexity there. There's an independently given pattern. So I, the, the way I characterize that is in terms of specified complexity. There's complexity and it's specified. There's a pattern. And when you have that, that reliably points you to the effects of an intelligence. Okay, so that's, that's the general sort of 
mathematical setup that I argue from. And then the question is, well, what happens when you apply this notion of specified complexity to actual biological systems? What you find is that some, not all, of the Behe-type irreducibly complex systems end up exhibiting specified complexity, which is a reliable marker of intelligence. Okay, that's, that's the argument that I make. So what you're saying then is that if you get a sheet of paper and typed on it is to be or not to be, that is the question, you know a monkey didn't bang it out, right? Not necessarily. There's, there's intelligence there. But it would seem to me that, that from what I've heard so far, intelligent design is not taking account of scale. That is to say, if you put a million monkeys mm -hmm. in front of a million typewriters yeah. and let them bang away for 10 billion years, yeah. sooner or later, one of them will type out to be or not to be. That is the question. Well, you can, you can, you can maybe get to be or too. not to be, but you're going to maybe, I, I've done actually the calculation because I'm, I'm writing a, uh, a book where I actually do this. How much of Shakespeare's Hamlet could you get if every elementary particle in the universe were a monkey typing at the Planck time, you know, for the duration of the universe? And you get about three or four, three or four lines of Shakespeare's Hamlet. That's it. But this so, is so to our discussion. That? Because it, what we're talking about is the difference between natural selection as a natural process that produces something and, quote, intelligence by which, and we can argue, I believe he means divine intelligence as opposed to natural intelligence. You got a million monkeys sitting there typing on their, on their right. machine, machine. If you want to make this an analogy that makes sense from the standpoint of right. evolution, you've got a million technicians standing behind them with a very large vat of, of whiteout. And every time the monkey types the wrong letter, you correct it. That's what natural selection basically does. It's not just the random production it's, of it's variation. It's constantly culling the useless yeah, variations. Exactly. And you're going to get... And keeping gonna, the And the computer programs ones. that have been written to do this get Shakespeare written pretty fast. Okay, now... Let me try to clarify this point. Is it possible to prove the theory of evolution beyond all reasonable doubt scientifically? What test can evolution be put to that makes us feel more confident that it's a reliable explanation than is well, what, what intelligent can, design? How, how do you no, test no, we'll get to him in a moment. The first okay. question is, what test can evolution be put to? Well, Darwin himself, well, evolu natural selection you're talking natural about. Natural selection. Okay. The natural selective uh, argument can be tested. Uh, in fact, Darwin himself suggested a test for it. He said if you could find any complex structure that existed in an organism that was solely for the advantage of some other creature, that would truly destroy his theory. Because the argument is that there's a... That, however, is attempting to prove a negative. That is proving why the theory would be wrong. What I'm no, asking no, no. for all is you positive to, proof no, no, that the theory is right. Oh, well, um, that natural sele we already agreed natural selection works. We did agree that natural selection but produces that minor variations. What I'm asking for is explanations of... That, minor, that, that of evolution would... would account that natural for selection could account for common ancestry. Yes, exactly. Okay. Well... Consider what we're dealing with. Th this is why I brought up the age of the earth. This is why I brought up the fact that we have lots and lots right. and lots of time. Because what we see when we look at variation, which is really a way of saying genetics, okay, we have heredity. Stuff gets passed down from generation to generation. The genetic variation in a population shifts depending on what uh, the environmental circumstances are. We have examples that we can see in the natural world where widespread populations uh, or uh, species that are widespread over a large geographic area, um, peripheral groups, of, peripheral populations of right. that widespread species can get cut off from the main body of the species, right. by which that means that they're no longer exchanging genes. Right. And we're not talking about individuals. We're not talking about that sheep evolving into that goat. Right, we're talking about a bunch of organisms. Right, sure. yeah. mm -hmm. And when you disrupt the genetic flow from that peripheral population to the rest of them, Changes can take place in that peripheral population. This has been done experimentally, and this has also been inferred. But big granted. changes, not changes of the kinds of the sheep well, growing longer hair. Um, again, over how long a period of time are we talking about? Well, We've mean, never see, observed this for 10 million years, which is what we're talking about when we're talking about geological time. So, I mean, and it could why be would you argue that, that the mechanism that we can observe... I'm not arguing anything. I'm asking a question. Okay. Can a test be designed that would make me feel confident that evolution does, in fact, explain the ch uh, descent from common ancestors? And it sounds so far mm -hmm. as though there are all kinds of things that make it seem extremely plausible. But if it is the case, and it seems to be the case, that you can't design a test that will take place within the lifetime of one of us, 
that would indicate it's not, it does not live up to that signal criterion of a theory that it is falsifiable, that it can be tested. Okay, now we've now it could be, okay. it could but be we, we've that because we're here. talking about eons and eons, no test can be designed, but that's just, just that's all I'm asking. But now you just shifted gears on Why is that? Because first of all, um, I think we were talking about whether natural selection can bring about descent with modification. Yeah, and it's big, clear that big it can. changes. I mean, yeah. Right, right. Okay. A little and, but it, it seems like you've just, just you know, shifted gears on me to, ask me to ask whether I can refute the idea of common descent itself, which can also be done. Um, a very, okay. In fact, the, the anti-evolutionists have proposed this for a long time. If you find human bones down in the, uh, in the uh, Cambrian or down in the Permian right, age that would of be fishes, clear. fishes. No, I didn't mean yeah. to. I, uh, so there, there's two I things. I didn't you know, mean the to mechanism, shift gears there. I didn't the mechanism mean to shift and gears. the Bill. process are different. Mechanism Testability. and the event is different. Can, can intelligent design be tested? Yeah, I would say so. How is I mean, that? Darwin's theory is a, basically it's a divide and conquer approach. It's basically there, what seems to be vastly improbable, you know, the, these vastly improbable systems that you couldn't get at one great leap. You can break it down into some manageable steps. And each step has to confer some sort of selective advantage. The thing is now, are there That's systems, are there systems <laughs> which, which, where you cannot find a gradual step-by-step -step, um, uh, increase? Let's say you have a system which does not have a bacterial flagellum and one that does. Can you demonstrate reliably that that sort of transition cannot be affected? Okay, that would be that would be confirmation for intelligent design. That's the sort of in-principle right. argument that we're trying to make. It's not an argument from ignorance. Okay, now another, okay, so what would, be to, what would it mean to test it or falsify it? Okay, right. it would be to show that there are, in fact, gradual routes to these sorts of systems. There's a, so there's a real question. Are there systems that are not accessible by gradual Darwinian routes? Or are all such systems that we see in biology accessible by gradual Darwinian routes? And if, if you can show that there are that there is a difference in the type of systems where one cannot be accessed that way, then you have confirmation for intelligent design. On the other hand, if everything is accessible by these gradual routes, then I think you've got confirmation of Darwinism. It doesn't sound good to me. I it mean, doesn't sound like what, it what, he, what he's saying is that what he's saying is that if we can't explain it through natural selection, it it defaults to design, and we really. All right, let me try one last time on this issue of plausibility versus scientific proof. It could have been that my little mind was just asking, pursuing a wrong question here, because I was thinking in terms of, can an experiment be devised that's conclusive or pretty conclusive on either your point of view or your point of view that could take place within one person's lifetime? Can we actually test these things? And it doesn't sound to me as though, yeah, it sounds to me as though you're kind of inducing, there's a weight of evidence and plausibility. It really is not an experimental matter. That we can't quite get to in either case. I, well, I think uh, it, if, if you could show gradual Darwinian means to systems like Michael Behe points out, bacterial flagellum, right. blood clotting cascade, I think eventually uh, these design arguments would just pass away. So but can, can anybody is. show them, or, can any, or is it just a question of arguing how plausible they are? Actually, there has been, uh, as Bill pointed out, a, a, a fair amount of work on the bacteria flagellum, and there's been work on the blood clotting cascade and the other things that Mike says are irreducibly complex. But the problem with that is, let's say that we come up with a really plausible scenario for the bacteria flagellum, the intelligence design people just say, okay, that's not irreducibly complex, but this still is. And yeah, so you're spending problem, your whole though, time kind of brushing crumbs well, off the, the table. You haven't, even, you haven't even come close to explaining systems of this well, complexity. You know, so, you know, it's... The, it's, the, the, the young earth creationists keep saying there's well, gaps in the it, fossil it, record. We'll never you've, convince you've them. Got, we'll you've never got convince thousands you. of paper, uh, papers on this system. I'm still a little nervous about the fossil You need to know more about it, honey. Oh, do I? Okay, listen. Listen, we've got to wrap it up. It's yep. television. William Dembski, I quote you, in the next five years, intelligent design will be sufficiently developed to deserve funding from the National Science Foundation. Jeannie? Good luck. You laugh I mean, him to scorn? No, no, I don't. Oh, you don't? I you do think not. he's onto something. It's I, no, a serious no, listen, intellectual this, pursuit. No, listen, this is something that I do want to get clear. And, sure. And I may, maybe more so than many of Bill's critics of intelligent design have, have often said, look, you are presenting a scholarly position defend it. Uh, there have been a lot of criticisms. He's working on answering his critics. And maybe in five years or 25 years or day after tomorrow, maybe everybody will smack themselves in the forehead and say, yes, intelligent design is it. But until that happens, Has he gained my any position, purchase on your mind at until all? that happens, it does not deserve to be taught in, in high school, which is what the intelligent design people are arguing. Okay. N now, let me put 
I've had her comment on you. Let me ask you to comment on Charles Darwin, not on Jeannie, of course. <laughs> but uh, so we've got these fossil record. Am I being a little bit jejun and naive about the fossil record? Am I going after something that really isn't a problem, properly understood? I, there, there are lots of structural transitions it's in the fossil record. There are. The thing is, you've got, group. you know, in, in science, you've got all, you've got facts and data, but then, you, then you try to put it together with various patterns and the, the, the interpretive moves you make. You know, if you're, I the think, wedded to, if you're wedded there. to, if you're wedded to Darwinism, you'll make it fit. You know, if you're not, it's going to look like a hard fit. So um, your charge against Darwinism is that it's at this stage of the game, 130 years after Charles Darwin's voyage on the Beagle, it looks contrived. It looks like a theory under immense pressure. It, yeah, it's certainly a, a theory under pressure. I mean, especially when it tries to make these totalizing claims that it's the mechanism that accounts for most of biological complexity and diversity. Do you feel that evolution is under pressure or still sort of I, I, I know that through repetition, uh, various anti-evolutionists, including design people, have argued that evolution is a theory in crisis, but you sure don't find that if you go to universities. It's just not the case It's at just, all. no. I mean, okay. people are mystified by this claim. Jeannie and Bill, thank you very much. Thanks. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge. Thank you for joining us.